This video is brought to you by NordVPN's Threat Protection, protecting you so you can browse with peace of mind. More on them in just a bit. Get ready to hear the gripping true story of a man who defied all odds and rose up to become one of the most feared and powerful gangsters in Hong Kong's criminal underworld. Li Lok's journey is a fascinating one, from his humble beginnings on the streets of Kowloon to his ruthless rise up the ranks of the notorious Woxing Triad. But with power and success came enemies, and Loy Lok soon found himself caught in a deadly game of cat and mouse with the law and rival gangs. Today we're going to uncover the events that ultimately led to his downfall. This is a story of power, of wealth, and the dark side of human nature. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wemmers here. One of my writers in this case, George, has written me a script. Uh, George often does the ones out of Asia, out of Hong Kong, because that's where he lives. And I don't know this one at all. Like, often when George brings it out. And people, I think, like these, because they're like, it's nice to see something that's not been covered elsewhere. Uh, this is the $500 million inspector, history's most corrupt police officer. I mean, that's a lot of money. Let's get into it. Oh, if you knew the format of the show is I've never read this before. We're going to explore it together. It's long, by the way. It's like 24 pages. Let's go. Put on your seatbelt. Don't talk. China is a country of great myths and legends. Often these tales blur the line between fiction and reality. From the Jade Emperor, who ascended from the throne of China to the throne of heaven itself. To Chang Yi, who lived as a mortal before drinking the elixir of immortality and becoming the goddess of the moon. But not all of China's legendary figures are quite, quite so old, nor quite so mythical. And from time to time, a figure in China will arise whose exploits reach such unthinkable heights, reach a point of such brazen absurdity and excessiveness that we may be inclined to conflate their stories with these mythical legends of old. Today we'll examine one of these modern legends, a young peasant boy who vassalized all of Hong Kong's criminal underworld, a man who seized command of his history's largest drug operation, a man whom even the governor of Hong Kong himself groveled at his feet in desperate pleas for aid, a man who netted himself over half a billion dollars, and he did all of this while wearing a policeman's uniform. And he got away with it, completely scot-free. Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> Today's criminal doesn't get caught, apparently. This is the story of history's most corrupt police officer, Loy Luck, the $500 million detective. Early life. As is often the case with lesser explored figures of criminal history, remarkably little is known about Louis Locke's early life. The little that I, George, have been able to uncover comes mostly from his police record, which I was able to access, as well as a few, as a few supplementary tidbits that journalists have uncovered about him over the years. So with that in mind, our story today begins just over the border from Hong Kong, among the sharp inclines and placid countryside of Guangdong province on the Chinese mainland, in the sleepy little village of Jinan, where on May the 16th of 1920, this little bundle of joy was born. At any other period in history, newborn Loy Lok would have had plenty for us to envy. A loving family, a modest but largely content life in a sleepy little Chinese village, a perfectly wholesome if admittedly meager start in life. I don't know, I wouldn't want to be born in the 1920s, because then you've got to live through basic... Like, <laughs> my grandparents were born, what? I guess 1920s as well. And they had to live through the Second World War, um, rationing, all of that stuff. They were too young to be in the war but like it's not a good time you know too much to live and also diseases and stuff were less treatable <laughs> it's generally not great actually it's really hard to describe but unfortunately for newborn Li Lok, the 1920s were not a wholesome period in chinese history as this period was defined above all else by the seemingly endless conflict of the Guomingdang nationalist government and various provincial warlords, all of whom were fighting it out for control of the decomposing and rotten corpse of the once mighty Qing Empire. The fighting would soon come to sleepy Xin'an with the onset of the Guangdong Guangxi War. I'm sorry about I know pronunciation. Look, uh, just, just roll with me, okay? I'm doing my best. That's not true. I'm not doing my best. I'm doing my best without looking anything up. That's a true statement. <laughs> And rather than being dragged into this conflict that frankly gave the Louis little to gain and everything to lose, they decided to leave their old lives behind and sneak over the border into British-occupied Hong Kong, which sat only a short hundred or so kilometers away to the southwest. 
We don't know exactly when they made the move, but we do know where they ended up. Cheng Chao Island. Even today, the sleepy little island has a population little more than 23,000, a number that was even smaller in Noilok's days. So rather than the culture shock of a country boy being thrown into the big city that one might expect as a result of moving to Hong Kong, in all likelihood, Noilok's life changed remarkably little following the move. Living in the same type of small country home as he had before, receiving the same modest localized education as he would have done before, and living pretty much in the middle of nowhere as he had done before. With the only notable exception being that now his family farmed fish rather than rice. This is what you imagine when I guess Hong Kong was different back in the day, but wasn't it always quite densely populated because it's a small place with lots of people? But you don't really imagine it as very farmy, do you? You kind of imagine it just like, I don't know, businessmen. Big skyscrapers, tiny apartments. But this was no life for the growing Loy Lok. To his adolescent self, this sort of quiet, sleepy life was hell. He wanted to see the world, to experience some excitement, some danger, anything beyond the drab mundaneity of sitting on a sampan and staring at fish for the rest of his days. And as luck would have it, thanks to his parents' most fortuitous relocation, the excitement he so desperately desired was only a short ferry ride away. Yeah, you can blame him. Like, I don't know, just growing up in the countryside or whatever, you'd be like bored. It's like, I want something more. I want to do something interesting. Let's go. Anything. Let's go. I don't know. I always felt like I also wanted to live. I do want to live like an interesting life. Like to do something a bit different, a bit weird. It's going well so far which is fun. And so he found himself in Hong Kong proper, where he took on any and all work that he could get his hands on, having stints as a shoe shiner, a postman, and eventually a rickshaw driver. But such professions would be little more than an adolescent deviation for the young Loy Lok, who in 1940 found his true calling when he enlisted with the Hong Kong police force, where he got a pay rise, a smart uniform, a revolver on his waist, and plenty of action. And what more could a young man seeking adventure need? Unfortunately for Loylock, the cruel hand of fate was preparing to hand him significantly more than he bargained for, because his native Guangdong province had recently fallen to the unrelenting expansionist hunger of the Imperial Japanese Army, a monster whose hunger for new territory was insatiable, and now it had its eyes firmly set on Hong Kong. And with the Japanese invasion of 1941, things get a little bit hazy. Uh, we know that Loilok obviously survived the initial battle and eventually joined the East River Column, a large communist resistance group active all across occupied China, whose numbers in Hong Kong peaked at around 6,000. Uh, we also know that with this group, he partook in many guerrilla actions, raiding Japanese military installations and escorting downed Allied airmen out of Hong Kong. We also know that many of these activities were brutal and horrific. And if I, George, may play armchair psychologist for a moment, I firmly believe that these brutal experiences directly molded Loy Lok into the corrupt pragmatist that he would eventually become and instilled the values that would carry him forward later in life. A burning hatred of rapists and murderers, a want to secure his own safety and position regardless of immediate morality, a willingness to employ violence when he got the job done, but also a man who loved, cherished, and protected those close to him. I believe you can see the foundations of it all in his wartime experiences. Oh my god, yes. At first, when George first said that, I was like, yeah, of course his past experiences shape who he became. That's obvious. But this is so specific and so related to war and what the Japanese did in China that it's like, wow, yeah, okay, gotcha. But that's enough moral pontificating for now. Let's get to what you really clicked to hear. Absurd tales of corruption. Post-war career. From our limited sources, it appears as though Loylock's early career was quite the commendable one. A poor lad who joined the police simply for excitement, but found himself having quite the action-packed, if not outright heroic early career as an anti-Japanese partisan. But eventually, the war ended, and the malady returned to Hong Kong. The police themselves would face significant reform post-war. Native Chinese were now to be given equal opportunities for promotion to senior ranks, which saw Loy Lok promoted to detective in 1946. This made him something of a trailblazer, as he was, in fact, one of the first native Chinese Hong Kongers to hold such a position, as prior non-white officers had been all but excluded from senior inspectorate roles and confined to junior rank and file positions. Loy Lok was a man torn in the post-war years between an ambition to be an upstanding and exemplary police officer and the brutal pragmatism instilled in him by fighting as an anti-Japanese partisan. His new role as detective naturally exposed him to the very worst in Hong Kong's criminal class, murderers, people traffickers, rapists, and of course, many, many triads. At first he handled them like a model police officer, treating those unsavory characters with nothing but dignity during their arrest. I don't know if that's sarcasm or not. But his fellow officers began to notice a change in him. Oh, okay, so he did. 
he was like an actual morally upstanding police officer i thought george was being sarcastic for where this story goes but no like all, all officers when the police camp was removed at quitting time loylock would rant to get the stress of the day off his chest but as time went on these rants became longer more fiery more vitriolic and eventually violent as he would begin punching and smashing his locker to vent his frustration it was only a matter of time until loylock's calm and collected veneer completely collapsed and the true brutal pragmatist that lay within fully emerged we ultimately don't know when exactly this transition happened as neither the direct eyewitness testimony nor the documentary evidence to say so appears to have survived but from the veterans interview for the completion of today's script excellent work as always george thank you oh thank you so much uh, we can roughly place it in the late 1940s as from this point the rumors of the brutal pragmatism that made lolok famous begin to appear in earnest one such incident occurred on the 7th of may 1949 when two british marine police inspectors and one chinese detective were murdered while on duty this particularly grisly incident saw two chinese sailors who had been on guard duty while their ship unloaded in hong kong harbor head to mears bay and commandeer a marine patrol vessel the crew of which most of whom had been on break were then murdered in their sleep save for the coxswain who was forced to take the vessel into chinese waters at gunpoint where 16 chinese pirates then met the boat and proceeded to steal the firearms on board you're committing many many crimes that are very very punishable right now like piracy this was a government thing is that like treason and murder like these are these are the crimes that are going to get you hung or shot or whatever they did to people back in the day the coxswain himself was then murdered the bodies dumped and the boat headed back to hong kong where the sailors planned to dump it and be safe and sound back on their ship long before it was discovered they would not get away with it however because they had been spotted the sailors attack had taken place just before the crew of the police boat were due to be relieved and that backup crew having found the boat completely missing assumed foul play and initiated a search it didn't take them long to be found a police vessel leaving chinese waters would have raised eyebrows at any time even more so when one was missing and unaccounted for in unusual circumstances it was then shadowed and its hijackers allowed to disembark at which point they were all arrested the charge in question was made obvious by the blood streaks and smears which covered the inside of the vessel three counts of murder apiece i guess that's enough but what about the piracy and all of that stuff like these are made they're gonna this death penalty time right this brought the suspects into the custody of loy Locke, who had been assigned as lead detective on the case and unfortunately for them the chinese detective was a close friend of his the ensuing tortured screams could be heard throughout the police station oh my god <laughs> like these people murdered people and all of this stuff um i'm not for them being tortured like you know often on casual criminalists well i'm like yeah he needs the needle in the arm and people are like simon your death penalty starts changed i'm like yeah i know but also i i would not condone torture like i don't think there's reason to torture like reason to death penalty yeah i kind of got behind that one but torture no as for the ultimate fate of the three men in custody we have absolutely no idea but the fact that the case never made it to trial and the men were never seen again certainly gives the very strong a very strong indication yeah no they were killed lulok or whoever had these men killed and they were buried in the forest or whatever and that's why there's no trial they didn't get away <laughs> they're all dead secondary to the emergence of loylock's willingness to use violence torture and various other varieties of extrajudicial violence was the emergence of his willingness to see laws much more flexibly so long as he kept the real evil scumbags at bay murderers rapists and the like i mean what harm would there be if some low-level crime continued after all oh where was the victim in such crimes as gambling pornography drugs and organized prostitution he reason he apparently reasons i don't know gambling people losing their money unreasonably gambling is like i am not into gambling i think sports betting sure i can understand the appeal of that but like gambling and stuff it's just a way for them be, like a business to take away your money and i get this it's exciting and and stuff I, I don't know i just always felt like i know i'm going in and then statistically the the the, the house the casino is going to take some of my money away and then i'm going to leave i just never really understood it pornography drugs organized prostitution all of these things definitely can have victims i think i'm kind of also a person who's pretty liberal like with the stuff i think prostitution should be um sorry sex work as we should call it these days should be legal um drugs as well most drugs pornography sure 
Uh, I don't think gambling should be illegal. I think it should be highly regulated. Yeah, but these things do have potential victims. Why am I pontificating on this for so long? Let's just move on. No one cares. These were all consensual activities, so no victim, no foul. If anything, he went on to reason keeping these elements on a leash rather than cracking down on them could even help the overall safety of Hong Kong. Louis, look, I agree with you. I just don't think it should be done by one policeman who's going to be taking lots of bribes and stuff. I think, like, sex work, drugs, pornography, all of this stuff, if it's well regulated, um, great, you know, tax revenue, um, greater safety for sex workers and stuff because it's not like uh, done on the black market or whatever. He would know who was running them, could build relationships with them, stop them from getting too excessive, and if it was to continue, well, then what was the harm of taking a little slice for himself? Well, because then, if someone starts offering you a little more than a slice or a little bigger slice, uh, how long is it before you start looking away or being like, you know, well, that is corruption, isn't it? And corruption is bad. It's always bad. All he would be doing was taking cash, which would otherwise be ending up in the pockets of gangsters. Now, of course, ladies and gents in the audience, we can see the deep chasm-like flaws in this logic, and I don't want you to think for a second that I, George, the the writer, am advocating for this approach. Quite the opposite, in fact. I'm simply telling you Louis Luck's logic as it was told to me by his contemporaries. Even if we concede that these crimes were fully consensual by all parties, which in the case of Hong Kong's pornography and prostitution industry was very much not the case, the proceeds of these rackets ultimately funded the triads and other serious criminals, the very ones Louis Locke uh, claimed to hate with a burning passion. Whether or not this hypocrisy was known to him or was simply subconscious cognitive dissonance, we ultimately don't know. But thanks to the testimony of a veteran officer who wishes to remain anonymous, uh, we do know what this early corruption looked like. He described a story back in 1952 when Loy Lok hims and himself were stationed in Sham Shui Po Police Station. The officer described going out on patrol with Loy Lok and how he would pay a visit to all the local organized criminals supposedly to investigate leads, conduct criminal outreach, and all the other perfectly above board activities that normally take investigators into such dens of depravity. But something was amiss. They began with an illegal porno store on Kai Lung Street. The establishment was hidden in a back alley and would have been completely unknown and undetectable to anyone who simply happened to be passing and let Loy Lock knew exactly where it was. I mean, so far so normally, I'd likely got good intelligence or had visited the place before. What was less normal, however, was how Loy Lock simply strided up to the door of the store without announcing his presence and strutted inside without a sense of hes hesitancy or concern about him. Even this wasn't too weird. Our interviewed officer went on to reason that Loy Lok was a war hero after all. Perhaps he had just got a mighty set of steel testicles on him and he wasn't the slightest bit phased by the dangerous prospect of marching into something like that. Quite reasonable. The reality of the situation finally dawned on the accompanying officer when Loy Lok then proceeded to head right up to the owner of the store, his face plastered with an ear-to-ear -ear smile, and greeted him as a welcome and valued friend. Lok and the owner then joked around for a while, making small talk about the wife and how good business was going, until soon enough, a little brown envelope appeared, one that was stuffed to the point of bursting with cash. Him and the owner then shook hands and parted ways. The accompanying officer then just had time to pick up his jaw off the floor before his palm was crossed with silver by his senior officer, a handful of notes supposedly to thank him for his understanding. But the officer was no fool. He knew what Loylock was doing. He was making him complicit in the corruption so that he couldn't tattletale to the higher-ups. I'd take the money. I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. The, the morally right thing to do would be to take the money and then still report it anonymously and be like, look, here's the money he gave to me. I'm not interested in it. I'm reporting this. Right? Corruption's really bad in the police. You should, this shouldn't be okay. The story of the illegal porno store on Kai Lung Street is archetypal of how Loy Lok began building his wealth and power in the early days of his corruption, one by one befriending every illicit enterprise in his jurisdiction and taking a cut of their profits in exchange for promises of mutual back-scratching. This undoubtedly made him a very wealthy man and netted him many millions of dollars, but it's hardly the stuff of a $500 million detective now, is it? To reach those heights, he would need to climb the ranks of the police force, after which he would gain influence over more territory and be able to offer significantly more meaningful goodies to his criminal comrades. Fortunately, it was nothing if not fortuitous, and over the coming years, fate would hand him several opportunities to climb that ladder very nicely indeed. Maintaining power and crushing the 14K triad.
Loy Lark's rise to power in Hong Kong's criminal underworld was far from a smooth process. Along the way, he encountered many hurdles. It could be a criminal who objected to the size of his cut, or another criminal who stuck so firmly to the old triad ideals that they objected to the very idea of working with a police officer, or even something as simple as a murderous criminal who took fund a fundamental objection to him and consequently found themselves with an overwhelming urge to remove Loy Lark's head from his neck. Whatever the issue, and whatever peril it posed, it was handled the same way. It was crushed. I mean, if you're making so many enemies, isn't... I, he, so he gets away with it all. We know this because George told us in the intro, so that's not spoiling anything. But, like, over such a long career and making so many enemies, isn't there a point where it's like, yeah, one of them's going to get you. One of them's going to get you. Like, because there'll be 100 or 200. And maybe you can bat off 199, but eventually something happens. But apparently not. <laughs> Apparently, he's incredible. There are many smaller examples we could discuss to highlight this, such as a triad who specialized in the production of illegal pornography, who, upon voicing his objection to Aloy Locke's cut of their business, mysteriously suddenly found every single one of his runners arrested and every single one of his vans stopped and searched, or another triad who insulted and slighted Aloy Locke, only to then have his car petrol bombed, or the triad who boldly declared that he was sick and tired of Aloy Locke's meddling in his business and declared his intention to satisfy his grievance by shooting him in the face. Well, a few days later, he disappeared, and he was never seen again. Loy Lock is proper terrifying. <laughs> but this is how you gotta be, right? If you're like a criminal gangster like this, you're just like straight up, just no negotiation, no messing around, just like, yeah, you slighted me, and now you've disappeared. Let that be a lesson to people who slight me. <laughs> Some Lex Luthor shit right there. So are you worried about online threats and attacks? Do you want to browse the web safely without any concerns? Then NordVPN has got you covered with their new product, Threat Protection. Threat Protection is the best tool to prevent viruses, block trackers, as well as ads and fake malicious websites. With NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee, which you can get at nordsecurity.com slash casualcriminalist without any risk, you'll find that it's easy to use. All you have to do is simply download it, log in, and start browsing. Whether you're using public Wi-Fi or browsing on your home network, threat protection works so you don't have to worry about online threats. It keeps your devices safe from viruses, ransomware, and infected files so you can browse the web with confidence. Have you ever been hesitant to open a link, scared to click on an ad for fear of becoming a victim of online scam and phishing attacks? Well, with threat protection, you can forget about those fears. It will immediately block your access if it detects you're trying to visit a malicious website. So again, you can browse safely. Plus, you can browse without being tracked as threat protection stops trackers from following around the internet and gathering information about your browsing habits. So what are you waiting for? Get an exclusive deal on NordVPN's threat protection at NordSecurity dot com slash casual criminalist and enjoy safer devices and faster smoother browsing and remember there's a 30-day money-back guarantee so you got nothing to lose like i say there's a link below and now back to today's video but instead let us highlight loylock's approach to, to maintaining loyalty by focusing on a story this story takes us to 1955. At the time, he had a very cordial relationship with most of the big triad families of Hong Kong. He Sheng He, the Big Four, and the Cha Zhou all knew the deal and were generally very content with it. There was plenty of mutual back scratching, and everyone made plenty of money as a result, with the only real problems to arise from these families typically being individual and usually low level triads who, for one reason or another, incurred the ire of Loy Lok. At which point either their superiors or Loy Lok himself would see that they face some degree of retribution for their naughty, profit-disrupting ideas. One triad family, however, proved to be less willing to get on board, and proved to be a consistent thorn in the side of Loy Lock as a result, and the 14K triad. In his eyes, they were taking far too long to learn their place, never being satisfied, and always asking for more from him, things that even Loy Lock at the time couldn't manage, such as the keys to a police armory that they wanted to raid, case files that they wanted to disappear from the chief, poli chief of police's drawer, and perhaps the most egregious of all in Loy Lock's eyes, a reduction in the size of his cut perish the thought <laughs> oh you're asking for too much for too little 14k <laughs> have you not heard stories about loy Lock? he is the and he has the same initials he's the lex luther of hong kong he's gonna it's not gonna end well for you loy Lock apparently hits a point where he snapped and was unwilling to compromise any further he subsequently wrote the whole of the 14k triad off as a lost cause 
And since they wouldn't get in line, they would be wiped out. And as a police officer, he had everything he needed at his disposal to do exactly that. Following this realization, Blylock opened up his evidence locker and pulled out all of the evidence of their criminality that he had previously buried, took it in his hands, and headed to Arthur Maxwell, the then commissioner of police's office. When inside, he slammed his evidence on the desk and told Maxwell about this evil and vicious gang, which was rapidly becoming an intolerable and no longer permissible threat to public safety, and they had to be crushed. And to do it now, he pled. And would you know it, Loylock was such a fine detective that he just happened to know all the names and details of every single member of the 14K in Hong Kong. All he needed was the green light, and he would launch an operation to see them all behind bars immediately. What are you up to, 14K triad? If you're bribing a police officer, and that police officer accepting your bribes, they have all this evidence against you. Do you not have something on him? Are you not photographing him taking the bribes, doing whatever you can, audio record, I don't know, whatever you could do back in the day? But you need to be, you need to have like your own nuclear weapon, right? You've got to be aware that you've got to have mutually assured destruction. Like if he does this to you, you've got to do it to him. Otherwise, I mean, <laughs> really? You need to have thought this out more, Triad. What are you think? Man, that's, that's not smart. Presented with such a horrific slew of evidence, as well as the testimony of the very trustworthy and not at all corrupt officer before him, <laughs> there was nothing Maxwell could do except but accept Loylock's proposal, and consequently, he granted him permission to launch his operation. But an operation the size of this would be no simple task. It would require perfect timing, perfect precision, and have to be perfectly executed to have any chance of success. If arrests were too staggered, the 14K would soon enough realize they were being targeted and disappear before they could all be arrested. Ideally, he needed an opportunity to grab them all at the same time, and after consulting with the few members of the 14K that he felt he could depend upon to be loyal and tight-lipped, just such an opportunity presented itself. A grand feast being held at Chun Tok School in Diamond Hill, then a village on the northern outskirts of the Metropolitan Mass of Kowloon. Several weeks later, that feast came about, and the stage was set for the 14K to be well and truly crushed. Inside the school looked perfectly normal, or as normal as a triad party can look anyway. Everyone was happy, booze was flowing, and everyone was having a great time occupying themselves with the sort of demonetizable activities that triads occupy themselves with. The only thing, <laughs> I don't know what they're up to, I'm guessing like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> demonetizable activities but in my mind they're doing that thing with a knife <laughs> you know where they do the knife like t -t 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 between the fingers for whatever reason because i've seen movies or maybe just parodies of movies the only thing that ruined this otherwise perfect scene was a notable number of empty seats what would otherwise be an occasion that saw the school packed to the rafters no doubt the attendees thought this was odd and certainly eyebrows were raised but any considerations to the empty chairs appear to have quickly disappeared once the booze started flowing outside the school things appeared equally normal but if you looked closely into the distance the eagle-eyed observer would notice the figure of a single man staring towards the school through a pair of binoculars a police officer no less one whose job it was to keep an eye on proceedings and give word when it was go time there's going to be so much they're, they're all surrounding the school and they're going to charge in and arrest them all right that's what's going to happen and they or there's going to be a big shooting because they're probably all got guns because they're criminals let's go the message was sent a little after 11 p.m a convoy of vans then poured from kowloon east police operational base and made their way to the school the attendees must have been most surprised a few minutes later when the door to the gym hall was violently kicked open and through it swaggered none other than noy lock who had a cocked sterling submachine gun casually resting in his arms <laughs> Why, well, yeah, you don't want to bring a knife to a gunfight? Go along with a submachine gun. He informed everyone present that they'd been very naughty boys and that they were all under arrest, a claim which was followed up by an immediate torrent of armed uniformed officers entering the building who duly placed everyone under arrest, arrest and carted them away. The 14K triad had been decapitated on one fell swoop. Back at the station, the interrogations began, and there was much finger-pointing at Loy Lock. Everyone was very quick to point out that he was on the fiddle, a triad in all but name himself who should be in the cells with them, but for some reason, these claims appear to have gone unheeded. Okay, well, I hope you gathered some evidence, as we talked about before, because you can't just be like, no, 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 the copper's in on the take. If you don't have videos or photographs or, like, something, they're just going to be like, well, no, he's a copper. He's a good one. Now, if you're big on your Chinese crime, dear viewers, you'll probably be fully aware that this was not the end of the 14K triad. George, that's probably about three people. 
<laughs> as they still remain highly active to this day. So what gives? Well, to answer that question, let's go back to those empty seats that I mentioned earlier in this chapter. For their vacancy was no accident, and neither was my mentioning of them because viewers put yourself in Loylock's position. What would be even better for your corrupt, crime-fighting career than a completely obliterated 14k triad? Oh, perhaps a 14k triad that was completely bent around your finger. That would be better, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, tip off a few of them, let them know, they take over the crime, and they're going to be loyal to you forever because you put them in charge. <laughs> Those empty seats were due to be filled by the various elements of the 14K that were loyal to Loy Locke and the Hung Kwans, who always paid on time without quibble, the Fu Shan Chus, who were always up for earning a few quid and were just as incentive and were just as incensed by their comrades meddling as the big man himself. They were all advised not to attend the banquet by Lu Lok. How fortuitous! With the rest of the tribe completely decapitated, who was now left to rise up and rebuild the organization? Only dependable triads Loy Lok could control. Uh, we can say what we like about Loy Lok, but we have to concede that this was a simply masterful play by him. Oh yeah. Like Loy Lok might be a bad dude, but he's a master of crime. Like so far. And as George said in the beginning, he got away with it all. This guy is a criminal mastermind in the truest sense. The best part of this story, however, is that because Loy Locke sold this operation as a righteous crusade of sorts, one in which he would delve into the underbelly of the beast and tear out its heart because it was such a great guy like that, he was showered with praise and accolades for his role in destroying the 14K, and he was promoted the following year. With that promotion, Loyluk found his position greater than it had ever been. He had climbed the ladder of the force to the point that he was now free to act all but completely at his own behest, to conduct his anti-corrupt capers with total freedom, because if he was out of the station for extended periods, what senior British officer wouldn't think he was out there doing something heroic and policey? But ultimately, he was still a little fish in a big pond. He had entire districts of Hong Kong under his command in which every single criminal knew who was boss and paid their dues accordingly. But the Hong Kong underworld of the day was much bigger than that, and it would take more than total control of a few districts to make him the $500 million inspector. He needed an opportunity that would send him into the big leagues, something that would send him rocketing up the police ladder even further, and thus give him opportunities to extend his influence over even more criminals and even more districts of the city. And luckily for him, that opportunity was right around the corner. The Double Ten Rise October always proved to be tense in post-war Hong Kong, and 1956 was no different. The flames of the Chinese Civil War had only burnt out seven years prior, and the embers of this conflict continued to grow red-hot among Hong Kong's 2.5 million strong Chinese population, who were still fiercely divided between fiercely loyal pro-communists and pro-nationalist camps. The month of October was always a natural flashpoint for these tensions, as the Communist People's Republic of China celebrated its National Day on the 1st of October, and the National Nationalist Republic of China celebrated its own on the 10th of October. Typically, disruption was relatively mild. Lots of flag waving across Hong Kong, a few drunken brawls, and maybe the smashing of a shop window or two. But this was not the case in 1956, thanks to the meddling of British colonial authorities. On the 10th of October, the Republic of China's National Day, an unknown colonial bureaucrat saw fit to march into Xuan Wan, then a fiercely nationalist stronghold, and begin tearing down the many Republican flags that adorn the town streets. This, understandably, was taken rather badly by Xuan Wan's residents, who began blocking access to their flags. The aforementioned anonymous colonial bureaucrat completely failed to see the tensions brewing and continued on with his scheme regardless, having his men push their way through the crowds to continue continue tearing down the flags. Then at some point, while a flag was being pulled between the colonial authorities and the increasingly angry crowd, a punch was thrown by someone, then a punch was thrown back, and this violence continued to escalate until a mass brawl had erupted. Having finally become aware of the full extent of their cock-up, the colonial authorities retreated immediately, while the violence was still limited to just the furious residents' fists. But it was too little too late. Pandora's box had been opened, and it would prove no small matter to close it again. A desperate call was made for police backup, but by the time a response was sent, the violence had fully engulfed Suan Wan. Any symbol of colonial authority. Phone boxes, post boxes. Oh, because they're all typically British. Right. And any sign or building displaying English text was uprooted, smashed, and burned, as well as any property or person judged to be sympathetic to the communists. 
The police had some initial success in quelling the riot with batons, rubber bullets, and tear gas, but as night fell and the rioters regrouped, they found themselves pushed from Su and Wan in the face of an unrelenting barrage of rocks and other improvised missiles. As the police fled, fled from Su and Wan, the riots spread behind them, and by morning the whole of Kowloon was engulfed in fierce violence. Eventually, the riots engulfed the European enclaves on the peninsula, and Europeans began being dragged from their cars and beaten while their cars were burned. By the next morning, the colonial government had lost control of Kowloon streets. In the early hours of the 11th of October, on Nathan Road, Swiss Vice Consul Fritz Ernst, along with his wife, were dragged from their car, beaten, doused with petrol, and set on fire. Wait, these guys were Swiss. <laughs> They're not even the colonial authorities. They're just like some random Europeans. Fritz himself managed to survive. Jesus. But his wife eventually died of her injuries. This was the breaking point for the colonial authorities, who mobilized the military and mustered every available police officer to crush these riots. But before the streets of Hong Kong descended into a bloodbath, Colonial Secretary Edgeworth B. David <laughs> Wait, that guy's name is Edgeworth B. David? He's got a surname for a first name and a sur and a first name for a surname. He had an idea, give command of the situation to a native Chinese officer and see if he couldn't find some way to defuse the situation. But who would they pick for such an unenviable task, I wonder? Oh my god, I wonder! Could it be our... I was gonna say hero. Could it be our anti-hero of today's episode? It would have to be someone senior enough to be capable of dictating the full strategic situation. Someone who knew the full ins and outs of Chinese society. Someone who understood the Chinese underworld would be handy too. And so, ladies and gents, who do you think fits that bill? And thus, Loylock found himself handed the keys to the castle, and with them, the complete authority to handle this situation however he saw fit. He was given 24 hours, and if the riots weren't in decline by that point, the tanks were going to roll in. It was but a simple task. He reassured Colonial Secretary David, all he needed was a big bag full of cash. Faced with little other option, David acquiesced, and Locke was presented with his big bag of cash. The plan was simple, Locke went on to explain. Split the cash four ways and ferry it to the four big triads of Hong Kong's underworld to buy their support, and then they would fight the riots from within as the government continued to push against the front face of the riots, which, God willing, would completely break up and disperse them. David agreed, and Locke raced off in the early hours of the morning in an unmarked car to pay some of his old acquaintances a quick little visit. First the 14K, then He Sheng He, followed by the Big Four, and then finally the Chao Zhou Gang. Loylock's pre-established connections with them all saw him race through the door of each family and granted an immediate audience with them, after which they were all paid off and brought on board with his scheme. And let me guess, he's going to take a nice little slice of that cash, isn't he? This must be a lot of money to, like, bribe criminal organizations. Loylock then gathered the government's forces, instructing everyone to prepare for several coordinated major assaults on the riot's key locations earlier in the, early in the afternoon. And soon enough, it was time, and at 1 p.m., the police, their lines thickened by additional reinforcements from the military and prison service, began advancing across all fronts while delivering a relentless barrage of tear gas, batons, and rubber bullets. The rioters soon crumbled, their numbers weakened by the fear of triad reprisal, and those few strong-willed enough to remain proved unable to mount any kind of meaningful defense against the renewed police onslaught. A particular note was the crackdown in Suan Wan, where a group of six Saracen armored personnel carriers, personally commanded by Lulak himself, pushed through the rioters before disembarking at Lei Chong Ak Estate, the very heart of the origin point of the riots, to supposedly cut off the metaphorical head. The plan worked perfectly, and by the close of the 12th of October, the riots were totally quelled and suppressed. Naturally, Loylock himself was highly lauded for his role in suppressing the riots and earned himself another promotion before he was then transferred to Suan Wan. And honestly, he deserves it. Like, he did exactly what they wanted. They knew what he was getting into. There's no... The only dodginess is that he's buying off these triad gangs. But he has permission from the colonial governor or whatever to do it. This is legit. But hold your horses, because if you thought this chapter was going to be some sort of high point for Loylock's career, where he displayed the utmost professionalism and dedication to his role in stark contrast to the corrupt colossus he was rapidly becoming, well, just wait a second. Because, like his crushing of the 14K triad, his crushing of the Double Ten riots was a well-orchestrated and planned publicity stunt, one designed to win himself maximum brownie points from the colonial authorities and ensure the further strengthening and progression of his career. Did he? plan these riots did he make those riots kick off did he pay the people to go down and around and tear those flags down and cause trouble that would be incredibly sly and exactly the sort of criminal mastermind that he is right he was brilliant he was outstanding in every way 
Ask yourself a question. What was the point of the armored car charge that he personally led to the very heart of the riots? It's not like the riots were an organized movement with a convenient central headquarters and that cutting the head off the snake would lead to the collapse of the unrest. If anything, such a move would only be a detriment to the overall effort as it would take vital officers and equipment away from the front lines, only to leave them isolated and cut off from support if the plan to crush the rest of the unrest fails. So, why did he do it? The answer is glory. Loylock wanted a heroic set piece of himself, personally grasping the proverbial bull by the horns and beating it in submission. And he certainly got that. This, of course, was great for his corrupt criminal catching career, as he now had unfettered access to significant parts of the city and their criminal underworlds, as well as a glowing, heroic reputation that would ensure colonial authorities would always see him in a positive light and provide some padding against any allegations of corruption that might ever come his way. And it goes without saying, of course, a healthy share of that big bag of cash went straight into his pockets. But still, there was more to come. What we have seen so far has certainly been absurd. The manner in which Loylock played the game and spread his corrupt influence all over Hong Kong was certainly a great effort and one which netted him vast riches as he continued to take his devious dividends from Hong Kong underworld. But still, it really isn't the stuff of a $500 million inspector, is it? To really enter the big leagues, Loylock would not just have to take a cut of the mundane and routine criminal activities, but make himself a vital and essential partner of some truly unsavory types. And as luck would have it, that is exactly what happened when he became acquainted with an entrepreneurial young Hong Kong lad by the name of Wu Shi Hao, a man who would grow to become possibly history's biggest ever drug baron. Oh yeah, he's just get, even just getting a little slice off the top of something like that. And this is the thing, he's a powerful policeman. People know he's a little bit corrupt in the criminal world. Some up-and-comers, like, yeah, you help me out, I'll give you a slice of everything. And then that guy goes off and builds a criminal enterprise, criminal empire, and the policeman, the loy lot guy, gets a little slice the whole time. He's like an early investor in a business. He's gonna get mega rich. Wu Ji Hao It's likely that we'll never know the full extent of Loylock's corruption. The fact that he got away with his crimes completely scot-free means that we lack the linchpin source upon which these videos often rely, a court case wherein all the nitty-gritty details of the case are uncovered and duly presented to the public, following which humble YouTube script smiths such as myself can do what we do best. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Loylock and his wife, Choi Chan, had eight little locks over the course of their marriage. Wait, they did? I think you didn't mention that previously surely one of them must have come forward at some point with some duty juicy details alas for some reason they seem remarkably tight-lipped regarding the origins of their lavishly wealthy lifestyles and their almost unbelievably corrupt father absolutely had nothing to do with it, the promise a thousand percent for realsies <laughs> yeah they're not grasping on dad because dad's making a mad rich and anyway asking about it appears to be a good way to get smashed in the face with a chanel handbag we can hear you despair through the screen though oh to be so close to such juicy details but so far truly few greater tragedies have ever befallen mankind but despair not because our video has a savior the absolute giga chads of the hong kong police data access department who are more than happy to share everything they have on file regarding their long disgraced detective so let us all down tools and have a quick round of applause for these cantonese kings for without their indomitable openness and willingness to tolerate my constant barrage of questions this script and indeed my past scripts would have likely been pieces of crap concert no no they'd be good they wouldn't be as good because i love this original stuff though consequently i've been able to piece together the story of loylock's corruption when it was at its real absurd peak so let's dally no further and get into it now, with that in mind, let us use Loylock's interactions with one Wu Ji Hao as a case study to typify the power and money that he accrued at his high point. Wu Ji Hao was Hong Kong's, and possibly the entire world's, depending on how you, who you ask, biggest ever drug baron, and the two had many interactions over the years. If you're drug baron, like, world's biggest drug baron, aren't you competing with, like, Pablo Escobar? Who, I don't know if this is, like, an urban legend or whatever, but did he have so much money that... Uh, he had to write off a portion of it due to rottage. Like, it'd be like, nah, well, we had 100 mil, but it was in a big stack and the bottom got eaten by rats or just rotted. So, uh, yes, that's that's no good to us. And it wasn't, it was like 10% a year or something just to, to rotting. 
because he couldn't, you know, he didn't have anywhere, he didn't have enough places to keep it or whatever. Wu Zhihao was born and raised in Dahao, Shantou City, Guangdong, but soon found himself drawn to Hong Kong, where the going rate for unskilled labor could be as much as six times that of the mainland at that time. He made the move in 1962 and soon found himself drawn to the criminal underworld on account of his continually climbing material aspirations, which soon went beyond that which could be provided for by a career on the straight and narrow. He began small time at first, dipping his toes into a criminal career by running an illegal lottery, but soon expanded into the drug trade, where the profitability of his lottery was found to be wanting. This was a career move which reaped serious dividends for Wu Shi Hao. He cut Hong Kong's four big triad families, 14K, Heng Shi He, Big Four, and Shao Zhou Gang into his criminal enterprise, giving them all a cut of his profits in exchange for their blessing to operate, and any up-and-comers who began to step on his toes, well, they just mysteriously disappeared. This pragmatic and literally cutthroat approach to business soon saw him rise to the top of the criminal underworld, and soon enough, Wu Ji Hao was running one of the biggest drug smuggling operations in Hong Kong, all based out of a lavish office in Chongqing Mansion's Sim Sa Soi. Few criminals can make it to these lavish heights without attracting the attention of the police, and indeed Wu Ji Hao was no exception. There's a point where you're like such a criminal. It's like you, someone's going to be like, "How did that? What's that guy do?" I asked him, and he's just like, "Yeah, import export," and it's like. There's a point as a criminal, right, where you just become so successful that pe people are going to ask questions. <laughs> They're going to be like, where did you get the money? And it turns out, oh, it's a drug empire, right? But his first serious confrontation with the law did not play out quite as he probably anticipated. It all went down on a typically hot and humid August afternoon back in 1965. Wu Shihao was just returning from a hard day's work doing whatever it is drug barons do. Making drugs, selling drugs, moving drugs, we're sure. And the hot weather had left him very short-tempered and in an irritable mood, and all he wanted to do was return to his nice, cool, air-conditioned office, sink back into his comfy executive chair, and relax. What he certainly didn't want was to be told upon his return that a police officer was sitting waiting for him in his office. Oh no. <laughs> As a criminal, that's what you're gonna be like, ah, oh, what's he doing in there? Is it all over? Do I flee? Do I get on, get on the boat and go? Time slowed to a crawl for Wu Hao. He stood there, completely frozen by panic. He began to hastily consider his options. Now, the rational half of his brain told him his fate was sealed. If the police were here this brazenly, then he was almost certainly done for and headed to a jail cell, so he should walk in with his head held high and accept his fate. The emotional half of his brain had a different idea and reminded him of the gentle indent of a pistol that pushed against his waist. Eventually, he chose neither option and simply found himself drifting into his office with absolutely no idea what to do. If you're a criminal, aren't you prepared for the? It always surprises me. I guess after a while, criminals get a bit brazy because they're like, you know, uh, the police haven't come for me yet. And now I'm in my big office and it's super comfortable. But I don't know. I'd always be like, if I was some international criminal, I'd like have a, and super rich. I'd have a dude in a mask with a boat in the harbor, constantly fueled up and ready to blast me away to, I don't know, wherever criminals run off to. Because... Yeah, it's all going to come to an end. Although apparently, it, uh, well, I don't know what happens to this guy, but Loy looked never. It never happened to him. Yeah, maybe most criminals get away with it. Who knows? He was absolutely shocked by the image that greeted him. A police officer, a detective superintendent, no less, sat in his chair with his feet up on his desk, smoking one of his cigars. That is some brazen <laughs> just walking into a criminal a drug kingpin's office and smoking his cigars, bro. You got balls. The detective ordered him to sit across from him, and perplexed by the sheer oddity of the situation, Wu Shi Hao did exactly that without question. This guy's like a real life Lex Luthor. He really is. I can just imagine this dude, like, in my mind, he looks like, I know he's like Hong Kong or whatever. Hong Konger? Hong Kong? Chinese? What do you call this dude? He, wait, he was Chinese, wasn't he? He was from Guangzhou or whatever. Um, but in my mind, he looks like Lex Luthor. <laughs> Wu Shi Hao did exactly that without question. You probably guessed who that officer was by now. Yeah, George, we knew. It was our boy Lulok who went on to explain every detail of Wu Shi Hao's own operation to him and commended him on the progress that he'd made. Louis closed this ultimate display of big PP energy by going on to explain that Wu had forgotten to pay off Hong Kong's most terrifying and powerful crime lord himself. Louis presented Wu with a simple option, cutting in on the operation right then and there, or he would on him from such a height that Zhu would think that God himself had taken a dump on him. Seeing little other option but to bend the knee, Wu Ji Hao did the sensible thing and cut Loi Lokin on his business. 
Much to Wuxi House's surprise, however, Boylock proved to be much more than a silent business partner who made a small investment of not breaking his legs in exchange for a cash dividend. Boylock instead took a proactive role in his organization, offered him the fullest protection and support that his law enforcement context could provide. This expanded Wuxi Ho's domestic market, and now his local rivals would all find themselves arrested, tortured, and some say even killed if they grew too large. This partnership with Loy Lok also revolutionized Wu Hao's overseas trade because his support suddenly gave Wu Hao near unrestricted access to Hong Kong's enormous port, allowing him to move the product all across Asia, all but completely unopposed, which quickly made him one of the world's biggest drug barons over the coming decade, with some sources even saying he became the richest drug lord in history. Eventually, he even stopped paying his protection money to the 14K, Heng Shi He, Big Four, and Chao Zhou Gang. Now, the tables had turned, and they had to pay Wu Ji Hao for permission to operate in his city. Yeah, did they not see this coming? Like, as immediately when I saw that, he's giving them money to operate. I'm like, what he's going to do? He's going to pay all of you off, and then he's going to become bigger than you to where he doesn't need to pay you anymore. Did you not see that coming, triads? Loilog, despite all his power, was not omnipotent, however, and try as he may, was unable to completely keep the law off of Wu Ji Hao's back. From time to time, a senior officer or the colonial governor would get to be in their bonnets about the whole hard drugs are destroying society thing and demand action, leading to some absolutely incredible and frankly hilarious scenes, where Loylock found himself having to act shocked as he walked around and recently raided drug facilities that he himself had been in only hours earlier. He's <laughs> like, oh no, what, a giant drug factory? Here? In my town? <laughs> The relationship with Wu Shi Hao had brought the peak of Loylog's power and influence. Finally, after years, his corruption had grown to such an extent that near as damn it the entirety of Hong Kong's underworld, including potentially history's richest ever drug baron, was in his pocket, and he was getting a cut of the lot. He was now truly the $500 million inspector. And as catchy as that name is, however, adjusted for inflation, we really should be calling Loylog the $3.8 billion detective. Oh yeah, this is in the, like, 50s. A figure that truly contextualizes how absurdly large his wealth had become as his power continued to grow in the territory. Now all good things must come to an end, and what good Hollywood-esque drug barren tale would be complete without the monumental fall from grace right as the protagonist holds the world in the palm of his hands. This is like movie right now. But for Wu Ji Hao, his downfall would not see him letting an M16 rip on the balcony of his mansion while he was gunned down by a disenfranchised business partner, nor fall into a nose candy fueled paranoia that led to him turning on his friends and his empire collapsing. Instead, it was quite a comparatively mundane affair. It happened on the 12th of November 1964. Wu Ji Hao was overseeing what was for him a relatively routine shipment 20 tons of heroin from Thailand into Hong Kong. He had done this a th- 20 f- Tons! Holy f***. He had done this a thousand times before, and he wasn't even considering the possibility of something going wrong. For him, the shipping of a whole container openly and brazenly stuffed to the point of almost rupturing with heroin had become an affair as mundane as a grocery run, one that had been so consistently successful that he'd long stopped fretting and stressing over it. He had flown out to Thailand to inspect the goods, so all he had to do now was fly back and meet it at the port of Hong Kong. He'd then distributed to his lackeys and to be laughing all the way to the bank. Little did he know, however, that it had been sold out. This was hardly the first time that one of his minions had turned on him. But again, this wasn't something that inspired any stress. Anyone who had to turn him into the police had to go through Loy Lok, who passed their name on to Wu Shi Hao, and soon enough, both the testimony as well as the gangster who had proclaimed it mysteriously disappeared before any damage could be done. <laughs> It's so powerful and scary. But today, his guardian angel didn't have his back. The finger-pointing file never landed on Loy's desk, and thus the traitor in Wu Ji Hao's ranks was never revealed to him. For once, the information had found its way to where it needed to go, and he was walking right into a trap. He opens up his container full of heroin and was instantly pounced upon by two dozen officers of Hong Kong's special duties unit. They appeared from around corners, out of surrounding containers, and from the rooftops, and tackled and arrested Shu Ji Hao and his comrades before he had even had a chance to react. Asia's and possibly the world's biggest drug baron had been brought down without firing a single shot. But where was Loy Lok? Where was he? Where? But where was Loy Lok? Where was the guardian angel? But we'll get to that in good time. Before we do, let's take time to examine another side of Loy Lok's complicated morality and see what late career colossally corrupt Loy Lok was like when he actually had to do some police work. The murder of Shi Li Huan. 
For me, George, what makes the story of Loylock so fascinating, besides the sheer absurdity of it, is the, at least as I perceive it, grey and unclear morality of the man. For example, there are plenty of corrupt and evil police officers in history who I feel we can all point to and agree unanimously that they're foul loathsome evil people. For example, there's Wayne Cousins, who raped and murdered Sarah Everard in 2021 while serving as a police officer with the British Metropolitan Police, and John Bauman, who murdered several people while serving with the American Cook County Police Department after World War II. I don't think it's controversial statements who wholly condemn these people and uh, wish for them the most unpleasant time burning in hell. But yet, when it comes to Loy Locke, who almost certainly killed more people, or who was at least directly responsible for more deaths than both Wayne Cousins and John Bauman combined, I find myself more reluctant to give such a full and whole condemnation. As far as I was able to ascertain, he only ever killed, brutalized, and tortured hardened criminals, those who refused his offer of reigning in the extremities of their criminality in exchange for his protection. Was this ideal? Would I hold such behavior up as a laudable ideal? Well, absolutely not. But in the context of colonial Hong Kong, which was a very different place to the safe and prospering metropolis that we know it for today, for me at least, this may not have been the most cardinal sin in light of the wider context. Yeah, I agree. I don't think he's. I, I think he's a bad person. I don't think he's the worst person who ever lived. Um, is he a bad dude? Yeah, he's, he's definitely a bad dude. <laughs> we debate in that. Complicating the moral question still further seems to be the fact that Loylock actually seemed to take his duties to the law-abiding people of Hong Kong relatively seriously, as much as a corrupt police officer can do anyway, and as such, throughout his records, you find countless examples of instances where he went above and beyond to bring the perpetrators of the most foul and wicked crimes to justice without any monetary motivation to himself. For example, there's the murder of Shi Liuan. The story begins on the 10th of December 1961. Shi Liuan and her husband, Zhao Hanhua had been staying at a guest house at number 35 Argyle Street in Mong Kok. Checkout was supposed to be at 3 p.m. That time came and went, and understandably, eager to get the room turned around for the next guest, the hotel manager, Wang Yu, made his way to their room to hurry the couple along and send them on their way a little after 4.30. At this point, let us hand the story over to Wang Yu himself, whose police statement I was able to get access to while researching for this script. Quote, I knocked and no one answered the door. I knocked a few more times, getting ever louder as I did, and still there was no answer. Then I pushed my ear to the door to try and figure out if they were inside, and I couldn't hear anything at all, so I assumed that the guests had already left and just not checked out properly, so I opened up the door with a spare key and went inside to get on with cleaning. The curtains were drawn and the lights were off, so I turned the lights on, and much to my surprise, someone was sleeping under the duvet. I then opened the curtains and started telling him quite loudly that they'd overslept <laughs> until like three o'clock, and it was time to wake up and leave, but there was no response. I poked them to try and wake them up, and when, they st when I still didn't get a response, I pulled the duvet back, uh, which had been fully covering them. Under the quilt was a naked woman, and it was immediately obvious that something horrible had happened. Her neck was tied tightly with a scarf, and she was stone cold. It was obvious she was dead, so I immediately called the police. It was at this point that Loylock enters the story, as it was he, alongside a couple of uniformed officers who were sent to respond to the incident. He initially photographed the crime scene with his fellow officers and then began his initial investigations as his colleagues prepared the body for transportation to the Yao Mertay police station mortuary. After first confirming the victim as 16-year-old Shi Liuan using a Hong Kong identity card and the hotel's check-in sheet, he then asked Wang Yu to provide him his version of events. Wang Yu described this initial interaction with Loylock in his later interview notes and perhaps surprisingly described him as a calm, patient, and caring man who went out of his way to reassure him and make sure that he was alright following the scene he was unfortunate enough to have discovered. Back at Yao Mate Shi Li Oh my god. Back at the police station, Li Huan's autopsy began to unravel the true horror that had occurred on Argyle Street. Removing the scarf around her neck revealed two full circles of strangulation marks, otherwise her external injuries were found to be minimal. An internal investigation revealed several small needle-like bleeding points on her heart, but absolutely no sign of heart disease which might otherwise explain them. Furthermore, no trace of poison was found in her stomach, but it was found that she had had sex shortly before her death, which was placed at roughly 6 a.m. on the day she was discovered by Wang Yu. The myriad of clues then found its way to Lu Lok's desk, who had insisted on leading the investigation. His initial investigation of the room hadn't uncovered much else to go on. A few cigarette butts, the lipstick staining of which matched that worn by Shi Li Huan, and the notable absence of her clothes and other personal belongings, which he assumed had been removed by the killer. 
Fortunately, he didn't need much more evidence to begin making some solid hypotheses. A sweep for fingerprints revealed that only Wang Yu, Shi Li Wan, and, uh, and a third other person had been inside the room prior to the police's arrival. Furthermore, Wang Yu's alibi was watertight, as he clocked on for work several hours after Shi Li Huan was murdered, leaving the only other suspect as the man who checked in with her. Mercifully, his identity was at least easy to deduce thanks to Hong Kong's laws on recording the identity of everyone who checks into a hotel, a man by the name of Zhou Han Hua. The search was then on to track down and bring in Zhou Han Hua, but in the meantime, Lo Lok immediately brought in Wang Yu to the station for an interview and asked him to recount everything that he could recall about Han Hua while the memories were still fresh. Wang Yu recalled the distant and impersonal interactions between Zhou Han Hua and Shi Li Wan, akin to that of a sex worker and a client while checking in. Besides that, the only interaction he had with him was shortly after he clocked onto his shift when Zhou Han Hua checked out early but paid to extend the room till 3 p.m. as he claimed his girlfriend needed to sleep in. Dude, this guy sees the murder, isn't he? <laughs> Super suspicious. A further investigation into Shi Li Huan by Loi Lok revealed Wang Yu's speculation regarding her being a sex worker to be correct. She was a poor girl who lived in a cramped apartment on To Kwa Wan Road, Kowloon City, with her 70-year-old adoptive father alongside her brother and sister. Her father was unable to work on account of an old workplace injury, hence their poor situation. The young Shi Li Huan did all she could to a better family situation, balancing her study with work from the age of 14 initially working as a dancer in Huen long before moving into a different venue in Portland Street in Mong Kok. If you know anything about Hong Kong, you know the reputation of Portland Street. It's a street at night that becomes a very easy place to find sex workers. The situation was a thousandfold worse back in the 1960s, so desperate for money for her family, it wasn't long before Shi Li Huan found herself on the corners of Portland Street. It was through this that she first came into contact with Zhou Han Hua and came to find herself in that hotel room in Argyle Street. Fortunately, however, Zhou Hanhua himself would soon be in contact with Loy Lok, as on account of his being a paramedic, he was incredibly easy to track down and subsequently arrest. Now, bear with us as the next part of the story is pieced together from scraps of contemporary office gossip told to me by police veterans interviewed for the completion of today's script. Apparently, Loy Lok started by calmly asking Zhou Hanhua a simple question. What do you believe happened to Shi Li Huan? To which Han Hua responded by spinning a web of lies intended to distance himself from the murder, claiming that Li Huan was formerly his cohabiting girlfriend and they broke up 18 months prior after an absolutely nuclear argument. Bro, wasn't she 16, 18 months prior? Was she 14 and a half? What the f wrong with you? Adding further that on the night of the murder, they only met up to rekindle their relationship one last time before they went their separate ways once and for all. He went on to claim that he left her asleep in the early hours of the morning, perfectly alive and well, and he had no idea what happened to her from then on. From this, we can deduce that Zhou Hanhua was not a particularly intelligent man, because, as per his story, the barely 16-year-old Shi Li Huan would have been 14 years old at the time of the so-called relationship, and given his age of 29 at the time, the admission alone would earn him 10 years is mandatory yeah dude you're not so bright are you oh god perhaps unsurprisingly loylock was not particularly pleased with this initial answer when he knew he had him banged to rights and now zhou hanhua had well and truly fully exhausted the well of loylock's good graces in an instant his garment placid veneer disappeared and was replaced by one of pure hate for the blatantly guilty man before him his finger fell on the stop button of the tape recorder to his side before it was sent flying into the wall of the interview room along with the table and everything else that had been scattered across it. A now blindly furious Loy Lok took the most direct route available to get in his hands on Zhou Hanhua. He then apparently started beating him with his fists repeatedly and viciously, furiously scorning him the whole time for daring not only to kill such a young girl, but then of the audacity to lie to his face about it. After several minutes, Han Hua was given a momentary reprieve from the physical assault, but only so that Loy Lok could take the time to draw his Smith & Wesson Model 10 revolver from his belt and push the muzzle firmly into Han Hua's temple, before asking him to carefully think of a really good reason why he shouldn't just save the judge some time and pull the trigger there and then. Whatever reason he came up with, it apparently was good enough to spare his life. For now. 
but it wasn't good enough to convince Loy Lok of the merits of his testimony, and it was decided that Zhou Hanhua needed a few days to think really hard about exactly how he wanted to word his confession. And of course, over these few days, Loy Lok and his other officers would pop in from time to time to make sure that he was thinking hard enough. Soon enough, on January the 19th, 1962, Loy Lok decided that Zhou Hanhua had had enough time to think his confession over, and he was formally charged with Shi Li Wan's murder. For those who are interested in how the trial went, he was found guilty and executed. But to bring it back to the main point of this chapter, the murder of Shi Li Huan and Loy Lok's response there too, for me anyway, is the perfect demonstration of exactly why he is such a morally hard to decipher figure. Yes, he almost certainly killed some criminals. Yes, he collaborated with criminals. And yes, he skimmed a very generous portion off of the top for himself. But he seemingly did only kill serious criminals. His collaboration with Hong Kong's triad seemingly kept the worst of crime in check. And above all else, when push came to shove, he did indeed seem to have a sense of justice and a will to protect the innocent law-abiding citizens that he served even if the law did end up as bent as a slinky from doing so was he really that bad i'll save my own answer to that for the end of the episode although eagerly listeners have probably already figured out exactly where i fall on that question but pay it some heed as we continue retirement A chapter such as this would normally be called The Downfall, the part of the story where today's criminal finally pushed it too far and got what was coming to them as their hard-built empire came collapsing down around them. Yeah, George, like you said at the beginning, though, he gets away with it? Just retirement? How many big-time criminals actually manage that? They almost always just die. In today's video, we don't get to have such a neat and tidy rise and fall lark because Loylock's story does not end with such a neat and tidy Hollywood-esque closure where he finally gets what's coming to him and has to bear responsibility for his actions. Instead, as we stated at the start of the video, he totally gets away with it, completely scot-free. So a title as dramatic as The Downfall hardly feels appropriate. Instead, uh, let's call the closing arc of Loylock's story what it is, his retirement. He left the Hong Kong police in 1968, with there being two conflicting stories as to his motivations. The first being that an unknown senior police officer, who couldn't be paid off, had taken major objection to Loy Lok's activities the year before, and sensing that his time may well be up, he retired from the force and got out while the going was good. The second explanation is much more mundane, that he had already made more money than he could spend in a thousand lifetimes, so he simply took early retirement so that he could put his feet up and enjoy doing a bit of hard-earned <laughs> cool. I wasn't able to confirm either of these stories as being true versions during the uh, research of the script so let me share with you my vaguely educated guess the vibe i get from having researched loy lock on and off for six months i suspect that the truth is somewhere between these two stories the amount of officers on his payroll was certainly significant but by no means total and all-encompassing and it's certainly logical that most if not all of the book officers uh, would have severely objected to his antics and loy lock was certainly no fool he was no doubt acutely aware that his racket couldn't last forever and soon enough the hand of fate fate would clench a fist and strike him down thus motivating him to get out of the force while the going was good and fully enjoy the lavish lifestyle afforded to him by his vast riches yeah it's often a you know like uh several factors it's like he feels the noose tightening he's already got loads of money he doesn't want to like end up dead or in prison so it's just like cool i'm done i'm done now's the time let's retire it's a very smart move. Whatever reason why he did it, his retirement in 1968 saw him totally withdraw from the Hong Kong underworld and the vast criminal mechanism of which he had been a core cog simply pressed on without him. His former criminal comrades simply now keeping a larger cart at the cost of no longer having his profound protection from within the police. But we already know he completely got away with his crimes. How? How could such an absurdly wealthy police officer, whose corruption was by then the worst kept secret in Hong Kong, go on to live the rest of his days in unmolested peace? Surely the colonial authorities would be absolutely chomping at the bit at the prospect of Loy Lok facing some justice and being able to claw back some of his ill-gotten riches. To answer that question, uh, let's bring this chapter to a close, and now look at the aftermath of his retirement, and the final, much more peaceful arc of his life. Aftermath For all intents and purposes, Loylock got away with it absolutely scot-free. 
He immigrated from, or fled depending on who you ask, Hong Kong in 1973 and found his way to Taiwan, a place that ever so conveniently did not have an extradition treaty with Hong Kong. So when a warrant was issued for his arrest back in Hong Kong in 1976, he was firmly settled in a luxury apartment in Taipei with his feet up sipping baiju, presumably out of a coconut with a little umbrella in it for maximum cliche value. Eventually he found his way to Canada, although it's unclear exactly when, with the most common dates either being 1974 or 1976. From then, he lived out his days in completely unmolested peace, jetting between Taiwan and Canada, or whenever the fancy took him, but presumably avoiding flights that connected in Hong Kong. <laughs> yes, or like any country that has an extradition policy with Hong Kong. Conveniently and almost certainly by Loy Lok's design, extradition between Hong Kong and Canada just so happened to be wavy and unclear enough to allow for Loy Lok to never have to worry about the Mounties putting his door through and carting him back to Hong Kong to face justice. Yes, again, like any country. But it's like now, because you've got want to get arrested in Hong Kong, you can't go to any country that has extradition with Hong Kong. But that's, I'd say, fair enough for not spending the rest of your life in jail. <laughs> Naturally, the Hong Kong government was none too happy about the fact that Loy Lok had slipped through their fingers, and if they couldn't get their hands on the man himself, they'd be damned if they couldn't get their hands on his vast assets, which, unless we forget by this time, his fleeing Hong Kong were estimated to be around half a billion dollars or 3.8 billion adjusted for inflation. Unfortunately for the Hong Kong government, Loy Lok was no fool, and had spent his initial retirement moving as much as his wealth of his wealth overseas as possible, and that which he couldn't move overseas, particularly profitable properties which he was reluctant to sell and the like, was hidden in a vast network of legally gray subsidiary companies and holdings of his friends and families that a Hong Kong government that a ho that the Hong Kong government found difficult to touch they managed to retrieve some after an exhaustive legal effort an undisclosed amount allegedly in the millions in 1976 and a further 10 million dollars in 1986 but that was it naturally these numbers were just pissing in the ocean for Loy Lark, who managed to maintain control over the majority of his embezzled fortune as for life after Hong Kong details of the rest of his life are incredibly few and far between because shockingly for some reason he was never particularly forthcoming when it came to interviews and requests for information no because he's not a celebrity he's a criminal from what little information we can scrape together however he appears to have dedicated himself to his family and very comfortably settled into the role as a wholesome grandfather using his ill-gotten gains to provide for his family and making sure that every one of his descendants got to enjoy the best education the best opportunities and be thoroughly spoiled by the family's loving patriarch while growing up his only daughter ended did he have eight kids? He had seven boys and one daughter? Ended up in Taiwan, although whether she was born and raised there or emigrated there of her own accord is unclear. Jesus, his personal life is personal. But she now works as a senior civil servant for the Taiwanese government. He also has seven sons, all of whom appear to still be living in Canada with perfectly normal lives. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're not criminals. Although all of their money comes from crime. Like allegedly. <laughs> But still. As for the man himself, he passed away due to gastric cancer on the 13th of May 2010 at the ripe old age of 89. He had a typical Christian funeral burial at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Burnaby, Canada, as part of a service that was attended by over 80 of his close friends and family. Then, finally, with a gentle patting down of topsoil over his casket, the story of Loyluk, the $500 million inspector, history's most corrupt police officer, came to an end. With his story finished, we can now focus on the really fascinating part of Loy Lok's story, that being the question of his morality. Was he a bad man? Normally here on The Casual Criminalist, this is a question so blatantly apparent that we don't need to dedicate any script space to it, but then again, the story of Loy Lok is far from an average case here on The Casual Criminalist, uh, where we typically focus on horrific and violent murderers, <laughs> of whom I'm happy to assume we all agree, uh, long overdue and extended jaunt burning in hell. But as for Loy Lok, I don't find such an immediate and wholesale condemnation forthcoming. No, me neither. I don't. I, I don't think he was a good man. I don't think he was a bad. I. It was just a. Most people are neutral. Most people are not good. They're not bad. I think this dude was incredibly cunning, and did some bad things, but he also did some good things. He also did some bad things. <laughs> he probably did more bad things, didn't he? <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> I wouldn't be debating this so much if George wasn't debating it so much. That's not to say I believe he was a good man, far from it. And I have no doubt that were his heart to find its way to Anubis' scales, it would prove weighty indeed, but he certainly was not a wholly bad man and absolutely had his redeeming qualities. Agreed. He was a war hero, and he fought to free his countrymen from the barbaric Japanese jag boot, and when faced with horrific violent crime, he clearly took his responsibilities as a police officer very seriously. 
too seriously in the light of the torturing. <laughs> yeah. Add to this the fact that innocent people never appear to have been on the receiving end of his violence and brutality, and that pleasure being seemingly reserved solely for serious criminals, the matter of his morality gets grayer still. I ultimately do not have an answer to this. Such deep philosophical questions are severely above my pay grade as a humble YouTube wordsmith. This is just some food for thought. The question gets harder still when we reframe it as not of one of black and white morality, but instead look at it as a question of whether or not he was a net good for Hong Kong. Sure, he might have been involved in some incredibly immoral criminal organizations, but we have to look at this in the context of Hong Kong at the time, which, far from the safe and modern metropolis as we know it today, was something of a barely controlled hellhole in this colonial period. Sure, he took a substantial cut for his troubles, but his methods helped to keep a lid on the worst criminal excesses of the time, ensuring a swift and violent reprisal for many who took their criminal activities too far. In this regard, begrudgingly, although it brings me no pleasure to have to say so, I have to concede to the notion that he probably was a net positive for Hong Kong despite his many, many shortcomings. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. He did a lot of, he was like keeping the criminals in check and yeah, he got rich and all of this stuff, but I can see how he could be a net positive for sure. Cultural impact. Now, you're probably not surprised to hear that a story as absurd and outlandish as Lloylox has been ripe pickings for the media, who have turned his story, with varying degrees of accuracy, into countless movies and television series. So this is a great opportunity for me, George, to plug some Hong Kong movies that I think you'll all love. In particular, I recommend Lee Rock 1 and 2, both of which were released in 1991. If you fancy something a bit more left field, I'd recommend the 1998 series Old Time Buddy to Catch a Thief. It's a romantic comedy based on police corruption. Because why not? <laughs> it's worth a watch. Dismembered Appendices. By a country mob, this video has been by far the most difficult script that I, George, have ever written for The Gadget Criminalist. Producing Hong Kong crime content is always surprisingly the difficult topics like this have little written about them, forcing me to take a more academic approach to the production of my scripts, using what is written in popular and social media as a springboard to my research, and then collaborating and building upon that initial narrative by trawling through physical archives, using old newspaper and media reporting, and employing freedom of information requests to piece the story together. And we commend you for it, George. I like, I love the original research ones, to be honest. But for Loylock, however, researching and writing the script proved to be even more difficult than usual because despite his big footprint on Hong Kong popular culture, there is comparatively nothing written about him. We persevered and got it done, however, even if it did take a very, very long time to complete the script, about six months to be exact. As a consequence, this does mean that my research methodology changed rather significantly for this video. I started with what I could find in newspaper clippings and books, which gave me a vague skeleton of his life, but otherwise I largely had to depend on the testimony of police veterans, as well as the Hong Kong police archives themselves, both of which I'm fortunate enough to be well acquainted with thanks to my day job. This video simply wouldn't have been possible without their assistance, so let's all now down tools and have a round of applause for these absolute giga chads. Thank you, guys. You made this, uh, you make this whole thing a lot better. Number two. In some ways, I'm almost disappointed with how the story of Lilac ended. Uh, we have gotten so used to Hong Kong crime stories with some kind of great emotional payoff, an arrest, a trial, etc. And we now just have a story that ends, where our protagonist goes off into the sunset to gaily live out his days in peace, and it feels almost incomplete. But really, this is what makes this story so absurd and therefore so amazing to write about. He did all of this absurd stuff, and somehow just totally got away with it. Yeah, it's rare, like, just to get away with it completely. Criminal Mastermind, a real life Lex Luthor. Thank you everybody for being here, for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll see you next time.